on behalf of the Southern Regional Council, the University of Georgia Libraries, and the Georgia Center for the Book, it's my pleasure to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this 44th anniversary presentation of the Lillian Smith Book Awards. And if you are attending this uh, event for the first time, you may be wondering, why are these people presenting an award in the name of Lillian Smith? Well, I'll try to answer that question with another question. What, what does it take to be a progressive in the South? That's funny. On, <laughs> on racial issues, no less. Let me just tell you there was a time, not so long ago, when to be progressive, in the progressive mainstream in the South was to be someone who favored a more humane form of segregation. <laughs> Lillian Smith, was at a center from that point of view who almost alone stood against this conventional wisdom. And as a leading thought leader in the progressive tradition in the South, advocated for a South, a society that reflected true equality, which was a radical idea at the time, may not seem so radical now. And so, since 1968, an award has been, been presented every year uh, in her name, honoring authors whose work is in the tradition of Lillian Smith, exhibiting a high literary quality, but at the same time honestly portraying the South, its people, its problems, and its promise. And it's been our pleasure to present those awards every year, and as the, every year it has grown, and it's now become a collaboration between three institutions, the Southern Regional Council, which originated the award, the University of Georgia Libraries, which housed the Lillian Smith Papers, and the Georgia Center for the Book, which sponsors and originated the Decatur Book Festival. And so we're pleased to have you join us today for the 44th anniversary celebration and I want to thank all of the institutions that participated, but particularly, we all want to thank the most hardworking members of our team, and those are our jurors who worked their way through the 38 nominated books to bring you two nominees and awardees today. Can we recognize, ask our, ask our <laughs> judges to stand. Please, please stand. Not only are they hardworking, they're also modest. <laughs> but I want to thank you for coming and hope you enjoy the ceremony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. In 1966, Julian Bond, in the face of blistering criticism for his opposition to the Vietnam War, said, I hope that throughout my life, I shall always have the courage to dissent. It's from this statement that Tomiko Brown Nagin takes the title of her Lillian Smith award winning book, The Courage to Dissent Atlanta and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement. I'm Toby, Toby Graham, Deputy University Librarian at the University of Georgia and Director of the Harvard Rare Book and Manuscript Library, and it is my pleasure today to introduce to you Dr. Brown Nagin. A professor of law and history at Harvard University, she previously held appointments at the University of Virginia and Washington University. Dr. Brown Nagin earned her PhD in history from Duke, her law degree from Yale where she served as editor of the Law Review, and a bachelor's degree from Furman. Tamika Brown Nagin has written a remarkable and a highly praised book, Encouraged to Dissent. It's a bottom-up narrative illuminating the parts played by local activists and attorneys. These were people whose courage to dissent applied to the white establishment, 
but also to the traditional black leadership of Atlanta, the national civil rights movement, and the NAACP's legal defense fund's high-profile attorneys. Their dissension, Dr. Brown Nagin argues, created an intra-racial tension that helped to energize the movement in Atlanta. In a review of Courage to Dissent, Catherine Nystrom writes that the book succeeds brilliantly, both as narrative history and legal analysis. For Lillian, Lillian Smith Book Award winner Ariella Gross, Brown Nagin's work heralds a new kind of constitutional history, and that it's a book that tells the stories of the good fight waged by ordinary people who, whether or not they actually won, had their day in court and became agents of change. In March, Columbia University announced the Courage to Dissent would receive the 2012 Bancroft Prize, which we consider a very nice stepping stone. We think that's a very nice stepping stone to the Lillian Smith. So it's my pleasure to present Tomiko Brown Nagin with a 2012 Lillian Smith Book Award. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And uh, to the prize committee and the sponsors of this wonderful award for recognizing my work, Courage to Dissent. Um, as was alluded to, this work has received uh, positive notice in other quarters, but I want you to know that it's really very special to me to uh, have an award that uh, bears the name of Lillian Smith, a woman who really embodied the courage to dissent. That's very special. It's special to be here uh, in Atlanta, in Georgia, and to have this work be uh, embraced by the hometown crowd. Thank you. Now, the book is subtitled Long History of the Civil Rights Movement, which means that it hopes to complicate the narrative of the civil rights movement that uh, we had grown accustomed to, uh, a narrative that centered on the brilliance of Thurgood Marshall and the Legal Defense Fund um, and the heroics of the Warren Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. And I have to say that when I started this work many, many years ago, um, a lot of people were resistant to the thrust of the work. They said, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, um, which I try to complicate, was America's finest hour. Why would you want to uh, tell a story in which that case and in which Thurgood Marshall, uh, the Supreme Court, are not central to the story? Well, what I want to say is that I think it takes nothing away from the brilliance of Thurgood Marshall from the heroics of the court uh, to talk about um, people on the left and the right who thought in terms of something more complicated than integration when they thought of equality. Um, so people uh, like Julian Bond, of course. Um, Lonnie King, I understand, is in the audience. Uh, he is a subject of uh, my work, too. Um, I talk about people like Lynn Holt, Ethel May Matthews. Um, Lynn Holt, a lawyer with the Lawyers Guild, uh, who was tainted, um, as a, uh, uh, tainted as a communist organization and who hasn't received his due um, because of that and because of our understandable desire to think in terms of Marshall and the heroics of the national NAACP. Um, I think it takes nothing away from all of those people to talk about these unsung heroes and heroines. It's important to realize the agency that they had and how they, uh, along with these national institutions, helped to form um, a more perfect union. I will also admit that um, 
Although I now am happy and eventually came around to understanding all of the wonderful people in my story as dissenters, when I first started this book, I was actually just as beholden to um, the traditional narrative as anyone else. I went to law school because of Thurgood Marshall. I'm a child of Brown versus Board of Education. And so the process of writing this book really um, was a conscious effort, involved a conscious effort on my part to be fair and balanced, and I mean that in the real way, not the Orwellian <laughs> way, <laughs> to all of the characters in my book despite their uh, perspectives, many perspectives, some of which um, originally I couldn't understand and didn't necessarily like. And I'll tell you about just one person in the book um, who symbolizes my professional struggle, um, and that's A.T. Walden who was one of the South's first African-American lawyers. He was the son of former slaves, um, a man who did not embrace direct action, and for many years had been understood uh, really as a foil of the progressive, the foil of students because he was skeptical. He was considered more conservative, uh, called an accommodationist in Uncle Tom. And when I came to uh, this work, I uh, frankly understood why he would have been called an Uncle Tom. Never embraced school desegregation um, and was just a complicated man. But I, as I wrote the book, I went into the archives and I did a lot of digging. I learned um, about his story. I learned, for instance, that he had been moved to go to law school after seeing the lynched body of a black man uh, in his hometown. I learned that he was the student, a student of W.B. Du Bois, a man whom he considered a prophet and a seer, uh, and essentially that his critique of the struggle for um, integration as only being integration, school desegregation, uh, was in many ways similar to Du Bois's critique. Uh, and so over time, I came to understand that in order to write a nuanced narrative of the civil rights movement, you really have to appreciate how much history uh, is biography. And so to appreciate all of those many different voices in the struggle. And so I would say, uh, in conclusion, that in honoring me here uh, today, or honoring this, this work, um, it really doesn't reflect uh, so much an honor for me um, as uh, honor to all of those people, all of those people, Lynn Holt, Ethel Mae Matthews, a woman who was a warrior for civil rights, whom I interviewed in the housing projects of Atlanta, and who taught me more um, than virtually anyone else about the struggle uh, against Jim Crow, the class dynamics, uh, wonderful things. All of those people helped to make this nation a more perfect union, uh, and I accept this award along with Professor Insko, uh, another esteemed scholar, on their behalf. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. John, John C. Insko is uh, the Albert B. Say Professor of History and University Professor at the University of Georgia, the Secretary Treasurer of Southern, the Southern Historical Association, and editor of the New Georgia Encyclopedia. Busy man. He has published several works, Mountain Masters, The Heart of Confederate Appalachia, War, Race, War, and Remembrance in the Appalachian South. But the book we are interested in today is Writing the South Through the Self, Explorations in Southern Autobiography. And I think it may be the wrong way around in your, uh, your material. In a time when people tend to discount the regional authenticity of the South, Dr. Insko has let the Southerners, African, Native, and European Americans speak for themselves. In the process, they define themselves as being from distinct Southern regions and cultures, 
And who better to tell about who and what those are? This endeavor relates so well to Lillian Smith's quest to be heard as a Southern woman and human person. As each writer strives to give voice to self and region, we have to acknowledge Dr. Insko's contribution to interethnic relationships and their importance in an ever-expanding world. In highlighting the autobiographers establishing their voices and identities, Dr. Insko makes an important addition to showing the many faces of an identifiable South. Teaching a course with this volume as textbook, one would move well beyond the duality of W.E.B. Du Bois' dictum of 1903. Through the writings of the present authors, we gain the knowledge to move ahead in the changing South and contemporary America, which is exactly what Lillian Smith wanted us to do. Welcome and congratulations to Dr. John C. Insko, one of the year's winners of the Lillian Smith Book Award. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate that very nice introduction. Uh, well, this is a real honor, and uh, I really want to thank the selection committee for really, among other things, putting me in the good company of Professor Brown Tegan uh, and her magisterial study of Atlanta civil rights movement. I, I'd just like to say, I'm sure as most of you know, there's no city in the country for whom the civil rights or the race relations have been continually explored by scholars than Atlanta. And to bring something new to that table and something new on so many fronts, both as far as information, insight, interpretation, new cast of characters, it really is a uh, tremendous achievement. And uh, it's a great read, big read, great read, and it, it's a real honor to share the stage with her. I also want to thank two people that are here in the audience uh, today, both of who had much to do with my turning into a book. What really started is just a couple of lectures and some workshops uh, I did with teachers around the state uh, there, and, and they saw something more in that and really pushed me to turn that into that book. One of those is, is uh, Nancy Grayson, the editor-in-chief of UGA Press. Alas, for only another month or less, she is about to retire and is leaving mighty big shoes to fill uh, and had much to do with shaping this as a book uh, there. And uh, Jamil Zaneldine, our mighty head of the Georgia Humanities Council, we are, uh, who I hope will never retire uh, there, who has done so much for this state and so much for the council uh, there. I think I'll just say we are really blessed here in Georgia to have such a first-rate State University Press and a Humanities Council, both of which are so deeply committed to and do so much to support, produce, encourage um, so much good Georgia history, literature, culture. And it's especially gratifying when the two of them team up on projects as they're doing more and more often. And I'm really grateful to both for the support on, on, on my book. They form a powerful partnership and we're all the better off because of their efforts and ours. And I also should introduce the wonderful new director of UGA Press, uh, Lisa Breyer, who is here in the audience today. A lot of you all should get to know Lisa. She's gonna be here for a long time to come. So uh, talk to Lisa and go by UGA Press booth and see her later there. Well, another reason this award means so much to me is that I've thought about and, and written about Lillian Smith a good bit in recent years, including in this book. In fact, there's no one I quote more often in this book than uh, Lillian Smith. I'm, I'm wondering maybe if that's why I got singled out for this award. <laughs> uh, I kind of wish I'd thought to work in a few quotes from Joseph Pulitzer or Al <laughs> Alfred Nobel, maybe. Yeah. Who knows how that might have paid off. Yeah. But uh, I'll, I'll certainly settle for this. Uh, this is quite an honor. This book grows out of a course that I have long taught at uh, UGA on Southern autobiography as Southern history. Both the course and the book are based on the premise that autobiographers are, or can be, among the most astute chroniclers of the South. Um, in part because Southerners, I believe, more so than most Americans, are intrinsically linked to place and region and find their identity in both. Lillian Smith certainly epitomizes that linkage 
uh, more fully than most. Her classic Killers of the Dream, first published in 1949, is hardly a conventional memoir as such. In fact, what makes it so compelling and so teachable, I think, is that she had such a flair for metaphor, for analogy, for parables, for anecdotes, and other forms of literary expression, including references to her own childhood and adolescence, but used all of them to probe the Southern psyche, and even as she uh, so heartily condemned the region's institutions and social practices at the time she was writing, to an extent that no other white son, as Charles Johnson made the point, no one else in the mid-50s, certainly no other whites in the mid-century, uh, 40s and 50s, no other white Southerner was willing to do, it, uh, do so to the extent that she was. And she did it all with such great insight, passion, emotional fervor, and often anger. And yet there was always a human and humane dimension to her work that I would argue continues to make it so relevant, continues to make it so teachable. But Smith was hardly alone in writing the South through the South through the self, or let's get that. Uh, dozens of writers, black, white, and both. I have a whole chapter devoted to mixed race identity and the struggles that many people writing their memoirs have felt in um, uh, identifying themselves by one race or another. But together they found that they could make themselves and their identities best understood by setting their experience and feelings within the broader context of place, whether that meant the South as a whole or more often through the particularities of uh, households, of families, of communities. Thus, to read Southerners' life stories is to find ourselves in churches, in courtrooms, in country stores, in classrooms, on playgrounds, in locker rooms, college campuses, in cotton, tobacco fields, on plantation porches, in slave quarters, tenant shacks, mountain cabins, trailer parks, and urban slums. We hear not only an author's own voice, we also hear those of his or her parents, the grandparents, siblings, teachers, professors, employers, co-workers, both benefactors and oppressors, friends and foes are brought vividly to life in the most skillfully constructed of these narratives. And through this cacophony of voices and viewpoints, we are exposed to a range of temperaments and perspectives well beyond those of the writer himself. We can learn a great deal about white rationales for slavery or Jim Crow from the viewpoint of black authors who lived under those regimes. Poor whites often come to life through the words and deeds of their socioeconomic betters. And women can tell us an awful lot about men, whether or not they raise them, marry them, exploit them, or support them. There. I'm not sure women, men writers, male writers get women nearly as well. I can think of only a few exceptions where men really do justice to the women in their lives. Uh, the other key factor that I think makes these works so accessible, indeed so memorable, is that Southerners tend to privilege storytelling dramatic turning points and cathartic and revelatory moments and pack them with meaning, insight, and feeling, sometimes well beyond anything intended by the authors. As Flannery O'Connor once noted, the Southerner knows he can do more justice to reality by telling a story than he can by discussing problems or proposing abstractions. It's actually his way of reasoning and dealing with experience. And again, no one did so more adeptly or to fuller effect than Lee and Smith who used her storytelling skills to fuse self with South in such creative and often startling ways. But many others have done so as well. And what I, I try to use their writings to get at a variety of subtle and not so subtle truths about the region and the society that they claimed as their own. Just a few examples here. Where else except through autobiography could we get Pat Conroy's account of how his black students at Beaufort, High, Beaufort South Carolina High School uh, all but attacked him in expressing their grief and anger over the news of Martin Luther King's assassination in April 8, 1968. Or of Diane McWhorter's discovery that her father had been a Klansman in Birmingham, who may well have been involved in the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in 1963 that killed four young girls attending Sunday school. Or of Morris Dees, who tells of his attempt only one week after that to lead a prayer for the souls of those little girls in his home church in Montgomery, Alabama, white church, Baptist church, in which, which led to a massive walkout by most of that congregation. Then there are descriptions by Jimmy Carter, by Maya Angelou, by Russell Baker, of local African-American celebrations at the radio broadcast of Joe Lewis's 1930s victories over white opponents as they witnessed them in Plains, Georgia, Stamps, Arkansas, and Baltimore, respectively. Ann Moody, John Lewis, Virginia Spencer, William, Willie Morris, and others have recounted how traumatized they were as adolescents 
to the news of a 14-year-old um, brutal lynching, the brutal lynching of 14-year-old Emmett Till in Mississippi in 1955, and yet no two of their responses are remotely alike. This is something where Lillian Smith is also, much, she was much older at the time, hardly an adolescent in 1955, and in some ways I think she had perhaps the most unique response to that crime, at least that I know of. Where else could we see seventh grader Charles March on the first day of the 1970 school year in Laurel, Mississippi, as his junior high school integrated for the first time, wearing his most fully padded winter coat to guard against the attacks he anticipated from his new black classmates and the reasons he found he didn't have to bundle up again on the second day. Or see sharecropper May Bertha Carter collapse on her bed and pray every day for several weeks as she sent several of her children off on a school bus as the only black students to enroll in the white schools of Sunflower County, Mississippi in 1965 and only come to life again when she counted all seven as they got off that bus at the end of the day, as she related in Connie Curry sitting right here in the front in that terrific uh, book, Silver Rights, her classic account of the Carter family's ordeal. Or to hear, hear Henry Louis Gates admit that there were aspects about segregation that he and his family missed when it ended, most notably the sense of security and camaraderie and even cuisine that the Jim Crow railroad cars offered, where they freely ate the sumptuous picnics they brought, played cards, sang, and socialized, all of which was lost when they gained the privilege of sharing that space with white passengers. <coughs> Or to read Walter White's harrowing account of being caught up in downtown Atlanta at age 13 with his postman father as the infamous 1906 riot, race riot broke out and of their preparations to defend their home as the white mob moved into their neighborhood the following day. Or Catherine Dupree Lumpkin's admission of ambivalent feelings, including sheer exhilaration upon first seeing the birth of a nation while a student at Brunel College in Gainesville. Or the intrepid Delaney sisters, Sadie and Bessie, who at over 100 years in age recall their own participation in NAACP protests over that same film's re-release in New York City in the 1930s. Or to walk with Charlene Hunter Galt through the arch at the University of Georgia on that January day in 1961 and follow with her the highs and lows of her first few days and those of Hamilton Holmes as they became the first African Americans to attend the state's flagship university. <coughs> or hear Ralph McGill admit that the two most effective, the decidedly unofficial mentors he knew during his first freshman year at Vanderbilt in the late 1940s were black men, one the janitor in his dormitory and the other a part of a road crew with whom McGill worked as a summer job in Chattanooga. Or Rick Bragg's revelation in covering the Susan Smith story in South Carolina that his mother realized well before that he, the journalist, did that no mother would abandon her two small children to a black man ordering her out of her car, as Smith claimed before the truth ultimately came out that she'd killed him herself and all for a chance to move up a bit in the social strata of a tiny, of a sleepy mill town. Or to see the impact of Katrina brought home through Natasha Threthway's beautifully rendered account of her Gulfport-based brother and grandmother and the very different trials and tribulations it afflicted on each of them, published by UGA Press. Each of these episodes makes for eminently teachable moments, both individually and collectively, and they never fail to engage students and generate lively classroom discussions about race, class, kinship, place, justice, and injustice. As a genre, memoir, and autobiography alone can render so much of our shared history as Southerners in such personal, intimate, and ultimately profound ways. I'll let Lillian Smith have the last word here in response to critics who suggested that she was too passionate in her analysis of Southern society. She wrote to her publisher regarding the revised edition of Killers of the Dream in 1961. Too much feeling, she wrote, perhaps. I could strip off a little of the pain, rub out a few words, but no, let's leave it, for this may be the most real part of the book. There is indeed the most real part of many of these narratives, in large part because they convey so fully what Richard Wright once called his crossed up feelings, his psychic pain, or what Fred Hobson has so aptly turned the Southern rage to explain. It is the emotional resonance, the psychological subtext, and again the sheer humanity that pervades these self-told narratives that allows for levels of empathy, sympathy, and understanding on the part of students in ways that no textbook or scholarly monograph can duplicate. I always hope that through their exposure to a wide range of these works, students will come to see and appreciate the South 
and its past in far richer and more compelling ways. It's what I also hope that readers will take from this book as well. Thank you. And now for a special presentation, I call on one of the original members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, three-time Lillian Smith Book Award recipient and our newest juror. Please welcome Connie Curry. I appreciate this minute, which is all it's going to take, but I'm going through boxes and I'm a terrible paper and box saver, and I've got all this junk, I'm, all this stuff I'm going through. And I came across this and just a few weeks ago, and I thought i got to share it. You can see the wear and tear on this piece of paper. This is the program for the, uh, at the St. Mariah Institutional Church, October 1960. The main speaker is Lillian Smith. She was the main speaker at our second national conference, and guess who introduced her? Lonnie King from Morehouse. Lonnie, would you please stand? <laughs> I, just, I couldn't pass up this letting y'all know that Lillian came down here to be uh, you know, our speaker. And Lonnie has been to, it used to be called Old Screamer Mountain, is it not? Is the old gone? But anyway, it's, um, and I have vis visited them uh, up at Old Screamer Mountain, and John Lewis and several other people have went up to the mountain to uh, visit uh, Lee and Smith. But anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure that all these years later that she is uh, remembered and honored because she certainly uh, stood by... Um, by us. Charles Black isn't here. He was supposed to come. He was the second chair of, uh, of SNCC. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, point this out to you and tell you how much I uh, appreciate it. Lonnie, are you writing a book? Yes. Okay. Just, I already knew that. <laughs> Thank you. Please join me in giving one more round of applause to uh, all of our, uh, both of our wonderful people. I want to say to you that uh, copies, if you don't already have your copy of both of these books, the copies are available for sale in the vestibule, and the authors will be available to autograph them in the vestibule as well. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>